Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm filling in for Diane Nolan tonight. Uh, I am a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. We've got a great show in store for you tonight, and we've got a panel of experts here waiting to take your calls and share some information that they have. We're gonna start off with uh, John. You wanna introduce yourself? Yes, I, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm uh, a Vermilion County Master Gardener. I guess I like tomatoes, vegetables. I especially like hostas and perennials, trees, uh, just about anything that grows in my yard. I've got them all. So, uh, but I, I just, I wanted to show tonight that you don't need um, flowers in a vase to make a colorful bouquet. Um, this is basically hostas, um, coleus, uh, fern, there's a fern leaf in here to give a, a weeping type uh, uh, effect, uh, some collidium, um, and a, Japonica, a fallopian japonicus, and then of course the hosta leaves. And uh, this is, um, the big one here is my Empress Wu, and then some in substance, and, uh, but I just thought it'd be good. Uh, they they um, really do last a long time also, up to a week, uh, if you keep them, if you don't forget to water them. And, uh, but uh, I just thought I'd show that and uh, just to, to give everybody the uh, chance to see that you can make something without having to have flowers. And these are available seven days a, a week, all, all year. So that's what's nice about it. You can just go out and get them. Thanks, John. That's a great example of what we can do in our own gardens. Uh, Mary Ann, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, ma'am. That was beautiful, John, thank you. I'm Marianne Metz and I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer and also a gardener and I, I truly love plants of any kind, just like John. Um, I have an email question this evening I'd like to share. Uh, we have a room addition that has a, a wall facing to the west, but completely shaded by trees. We would like to plant evergreen shrubs along the foundation to create a buffer from the south and west winds. Can you recommend any shade tolerant shrubs? We live in Elgin, Illinois. Well, that's going to be uh, pretty reasonably uh, similar to Champaign County, and I think there are a number of shade tolerant uh, evergreens. A lot of people think that sh gardening in the shade is a, a awful thing to have happen to them, but I happen to think that shade gardening is a really very joyful thing to do. Uh, foundation plantings are just essential in most homes of, of some kind, and probably one that um, I didn't ever used to like, but I really do now, are, are boxes or boxwoods. Uh, many, many available in the market right now, small, mediums, larges, but the newer hybrids seem to uh, tolerate the Midwest wind and cold in the wintertime so much better than they used to. Uh, maybe not so tolerant of salt, so if it's close to a sidewalk, you may want to uh, just be careful about that one. But you, of course, um, taxes or use will of course tolerate shade. And again, you can get tall ones, short ones, everything in between. The uh, really great thing about evergreens and using them for sh uh, foundation plantings is that they're very prunable. Most of them have great form without pruning, but mm -hmm. um, those are just two. So ilex or, or hollies, there's uh, several species of hollies that would be very appropriate for uh, foundation plantings. And there's um, a couple of ke uh, chemiciparous or uh, false uh, cypress that would be pretty good. The obtuses are particularly nice in a shaded area. Great, thanks Marianne, sure. great tips. Uh, Doug, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Hello everybody, I'm Doug Williams. I am a research fellow at the University of Illinois with a background in landscape architecture and horticulture. So I look forward to answering your questions about landscape design and some woody plant care uh, within the landscape. So I look forward to sharing with you. First off, this evening I'd like to talk to you about um, flowers as well, much like John has noted. Um, I have, um, these are freshly cut these are nasturtiums. Uh, they come in warm colors, oranges, reds. Um, and they also not only have uh, the solid green leaves, which you see here, which are almost very large and coin-shaped. Um, I've seen them actually almost the size of my hand uh, and maybe even sometimes larger. But these are not only aesthetically pleasing, but they're also edible. Um, they have a sort of watercress, but almost a peppery taste. You'll find that um, you can place them in your fruit salads, uh, in your leaf uh, or vegetable salads. Um, but they're also good to, uh, in a, for a festive effect uh, to garnish any meal that you're having at any time of the day in the summertime when they're fresh. 
You'll find that people also float them on their favorite beverages, uh, maybe for a wedding punch and what have you. And just to prove that they are edible, I like to always do this when I'm around my students. <laughs> and they're like, what, you just ate that? I'm like, yeah. So you can take one off. Very nice. And I'm sure uh, Bob Skirvin's getting a kick out of this too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this one is quite peppery, so you can feel um, the spice that's there. I don't think you can cook with it and it'll still have the same peppery flavor mm -hmm. as if you were um, seasoning your food with pepper. Um, but however, um, even the leaves are edible too, but I won't entertain you and then I'll let you try that out <laughs> and, um, and have some fun with that too. <laughs> Thanks, so. Doug. It's great to have some alternatives uh, to snack in the garden too. So uh, right now it's time to go to our Did You Know video on broccoli today. Broccoli was introduced to the U.S. by Italian immigrants, but did not become popular until the 1920s. Thanks a lot. Right now we're going to go to the phones and line two. Carol has a question on garden nutrient loss. Hi. Hi, Carol. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, we kind of have a problem in our garden, and we were wondering what is the best thing to plant as a maybe fall to spring ground cover that uh, we could cut down in the spring that would help put nutrients back into the soil. I'm assuming this is in your vegetable garden? Yes, and especially where we're trying to grow corn. We're having quite a problem. We've had our soil tested. We did what they told us to do, but we're still having um, a problem. Um, some of the, the, there are some green manures that they actually make for that. Uh, some of the clovers are real good in nitrogen mm -hmm. fixing. Some of the legumes um, are good in nitrogen fixing. So uh, <clears throat> just go on the internet and look for uh, nitrogen fixing uh, plants. And those are two that I know do fairly mm -hmm. well here. Um, I'm sure there's some others that are. We've had good luck with, it's not a nitrogen fixer, but winter rye does mm -hmm. well here as yes, a green manure. Yeah. Also, I would suggest rotating where you're planting your corn. Corn can be really, uh, just strip the soil of nitrogen, so yeah. make sure you're alternating maybe with green beans or a, a, a crop that would fix nitrogen. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. Okay, line three, Joanne has a garden pest question. Hi, thank you for taking my call tonight. Um, we have a flower bed and we have um, the tiger lilies along the back and some other day lilies. And we planted rose moss in the front and some Asiatic lilies. Uh, something all since May when we planted it has eaten the rose moss down to just a few little um, pieces sticking out of the ground. And also it's eaten the Asiatic lilies. We have some rose moss that is probably in another bed about six foot away and nothing bothers it and nothing bothers any of our other plants. I have tried putting red pepper on it and that didn't work. They must have liked it because <laughs> they finished off the lily. Probably a couple things, um, yeah. be, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, if the cut is at an angle, it's probably deer. Um, they, uh, I know they like, they, I've had with my lilies, they've They've chopped them off. This year, was I didn't have a problem. I've got foxes in the area, so oh, I think yeah. it's kept the deer away. But if you look at the, the top of the, where the, the, the part of the stem that's left, and it's kind of at an angle, that's how deer kind of chomp, and they cut it at an angle, then you know it's a deer. But there's other... Lilliums I have also in my garden, but I had a rabbit. Mm -hmm. And the rabbit um, not only eats the flower right off of the top, but strips the leaves mm -hmm. off of it, so mm -hmm. I just have mm -hmm. stems sticking mm -hmm. up. So that's a, probably a dead right. giveaway about yeah. rabbits, but they love Asiatics. Yeah. Well, and I would say if your garden is in an area where it, there's some shelter for the rabbit, easy for them to hide, yes. they're gonna go af after that bed before they go after another bed that wouldn't have, offer as much protection. That's right, they're creatures of habit. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Joanne. Okay, line four, we have a question on harvesting rhubarb. Hello. Yes, uh, when should you quit picking rhubarb? You can pick it all clear up to frost. You don't want to pick it after frost. Yeah, I would I would leave some some right. of the leaves on there just for regeneration or re re uh, fortification of the mm -hmm. roots. 
um, but you can pick them up. I mean, you can pick a certain amount anytime, like you said, up to frost. Mm -hmm. Once it frosts, you don't want to pick it because there is a crystal in the leaves that will tend to mm -hmm. go down into the stock. Normally, it doesn't go down there when we're during the normal part of the year, mm -hmm. but it would be very irritating to the to the, your stomach and to your esophagus uh, lining. So um, just remember not to pick ever pick at all because you do want those. You need something to help those roots uh, keep their strength and to right. build up so they survive the winter time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Great calls tonight. Uh, we're going to take some time now to go through another round. We've got some more show and tells and emails to, to cover. So, John, let's start with you. You have okay. an email. I had a question from Marilyn, uh, and this has to do basically in the spring, but when starting tomato plants from seed, what is the best uh, to do if they become laggy before it's time to plant them outside? Raise the grow lights, lower the grow lights. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, don't start them too early. That's, the, that's one thing because we all have difficulty, unless you have a greenhouse, you're gonna really have a, a difficult time getting enough light on those tomato plants where they, do, where they don't get um, leggy. Uh, if you can get, I noticed uh, on the picture, I, I'm not sure if that's your picture or not, but um, get it as close to an outside light source as you can and then the light source should be within two inches of the top of the plant and have that so that you can because the plants are going to grow so you don't want the plants to be touching it because you might cause too, uh, a little bit of burning or heat damage to the plant so you need a chain or some way to to raise those as it grows if you still get too too leggy of a plant the thing to do except for one type of tomato um, is to plant it um, deeper uh, you can plant it all the way up to the first so that there's only one or two sets of leaves and all the rest just dig that hole real deep the one exception to that is if you have a grafted i know grafted tomatoes are getting to be very popular and especially for disease resistance if you plant that graft below the ground level um, you're going to lose the any advantage mm -hmm. you had with the graft so Great, thanks john great point on the grafted tomatoes those are really interesting to me i like them yeah, <laughs> good. Marianne, let's sit, talk about your show and tell that you Yeah, brought. I'm excited about this. This has been a great um, bloom season for um, a lot of things, but hydrangeas right now are just really showing off. Um, I wanted to show people that there are so many variations on hydrangeas and the forms of the flowers, the form of the flower cluster, the colors. Um, I, I could name all of these for you, but I think it would take too much time. But uh, just quickly, there in, in our area and, and up north of us also, um, the species that are, are good to grow are, are certainly the paniculatas. If you think panicle, paniculata, mm -hmm. it has a longer cone to it. So it's, it's an easy one to grow here. Um, and absolutely beautiful, many, many selections. Some of the paniculatas, particularly with these beautiful white flowers, have these nice dark reddish mm -hmm. stems, really a nice contrast to the to the foliage to the lush green foliage and the uh, beautiful flowers they're double form this one's particularly mm. nice it was pure white when it was flowering it's at its end right now mm. but it's turned green in its aging and um, it's a double flower form but a nice big cluster head I believe the na variety name of that one is is a bridal gown but arborescence, the big Annabelles, mm -hmm. that's what uh, typically mm -hmm. people think of, the big uh, white flowers or mm -hmm. snowball plant. Mm -hmm. have many people ask that. Uh, macrophyllas are also very easy around here. Um, Corsifolia is the oak leaf hydrangea, one of my very, very favorites. Mm -hmm. a different, totally different texture. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a long panicle, but it's much more open than the paniculatas are, so it really gives you a nice texture. And um, the really neat thing about some of the varieties in the market right now is that there's one for every garden. Um, mm -hmm. From some of the newest ones, I've, I've just one in the market this year, a little tough stuff, a um, couple feet tall, up to something that's 15 feet tall. So there's, you have a small garden, there's sure. that plant. If you have a big garden, there's a plant for your garden also. Great. So we all should be growing hydrangeas in some Of some, some kind, form. yes, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Marianne. Doug, you've got a question about a uh, black gum root. Yeah, I, uh, one of our, one of our uh, friends wrote in to us and asked about a black gum tree they've had for about five years and it is approximately four inches in diameter um, and they have a root as they show on the image here that has surrounded the tree right at the very point of um, mm -hmm. the root, root or the main stem touching the, the ground surface 
and it look it appears that it's actually um, wrapped around horizontally around the entire um, base of the tree, which is quite detrimental. Um, and so the question was, will this harm the tree? Yes. And what can you do to correct this? Well, at this point in time, um, it seems like it might be too late. However, you can uh, attempt to try to do some surgery here. Um, <laughs> really dig around a tree the way it's shown in the image, uh, clear it out as much as possible, and then cut away um, at this particular branch to remove it. Um, I'm not sure where it is attached to the tree, but I believe it's coming from this tree in particular. If you can remove that, um, hopefully um, the other portion of the bark that has been included uh, between the main stem and the uh, girdling branch that's there at the base, uh, it can heal. Uh, if not, then it looks like you may have to replace the tree because the uh, phloem up or the xylem down, which is the um, vascular system of the tree, is underneath the bark. Um, mm -hmm. And that's on the, just underneath the bark. So it appears that it's probably in competition right now and has been for maybe over mm -hmm. a year. So that's five years, time. I know it's really hard to get rid of that tree because it's starting to get established. But with this type of condition, it means that it may um, be better off just um, trying to do the surgery and see what happens. If not, feel free and, and take the loss and, and plant something <laughs> new. Yeah. And be sure that when you get the new plant that it does not have, um, uh, it hasn't been root bound. Mm -hmm. If it's been po if it's been grown in a nursery, um, be sure that you're getting some good quality plant material that you're planting in your landscape. Because if you don't, you will end up with this condition. And make sure you have good soil uh, when you plant mm -hmm. too, because that can also um, promote um, this problem with trees. Great, thanks, Doug. Next, we have a Mid American Gardener quiz on one of my favorite plants, the Titan Arum. The plant Titan Arum also goes by the name A, the wonder plant, B, corpse plant, C, giant plant eater. B, corpse plant. The flower of the Titan Arum produces a smell like that of rotting meat, enabling it to be pollinated by flies. If you ever get a chance to see the Titan Arum in person, I highly encourage you to go out and see it. It's it's something that you will remember for a lifetime. Yeah, but fabulous. you don't want to smell it. You right. don't want to smell it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go back to the phones for a little bit here. And on line two, Bill has a question on pepper plants. Uh, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Um, I'm having a problem with pepper plants, especially this year. I noticed I talked to you folks a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I heard it on your show that... That the, the rain really affected some of the plants this year and just now mm -hmm. starting to see the problems um, leaves are falling down I'm getting very minimal yield mm -hmm. do should I wait until late summer and early fall for them to come back or should I just pull them out and work that ground for a fall crop Hmm. Unless they're diseased, I would. I, I mean, you have nothing to lose unless right. they're diseased, and 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 you're afraid that it's going to affect other plants in the area. Um, I have, I, you know, we've had hot weather, like we've had some of the uh, tomatoes and other things aborting fruit now. For a while, it was so cool and wet that we didn't. They, mm -hmm. it, it, they just didn't produce. So we've had from one extreme to the other, and I would be patient uh, unless there's actual disease. And, and I w if, if you have leaf drop, just clean those leaves up okay. around there, so, and maybe spread a little fresh mulch so that if rain comes, it doesn't splash on the ground and splash up to the, the bottom leaves again, and just, just hope for the best. Uh, yeah. Right, I've noticed on my own peppers the same problem with dropping mm -hmm. leaves. Uh, I am getting some peppers though, and when we've had this hot weather, that they like the heat and the yeah. moisture, so that yeah. will promote some fruit set, but we don't want too much heat. Yeah. Uh, but we were talking before the show, the weather has just caused a lot of problems with tomatoes, mm -hmm. and yes, it we've, has. we've had about every problem you can we've think of. We've had early of. blight and even some late blight now yeah. already. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Many problems. Yeah. Okay, hey, uh, we're looking for some more callers this evening, so if anyone's out there has got a question, uh, whether related or not, uh, give us a call. And uh, what other weather problems are you guys seeing? Um, well, I've got um, a lot of different molds on my plants. The, some of the uh, city molds, the uh, uh, gray molds, the 
uh, you name the mold, and I probably mm -hmm. have it. Uh, some of the uh, peonies are, are, are getting really infected. One thing that I normally see is on my catalpa tree, and it's, it so far is fine. A lot of times during this time of the year, mm -hmm. the catalpa trees are, are, are turning black uh, and, and dropping leaves. I did notice some of the sycamores, uh, they're back with anthracnose mm -hmm. again. That was a problem very early, but right now, uh, with all the high humidity at night, I, I know our dew points have been in the 70s, and the trees never seem to, or the plants never seem to dry out completely, and it's just been a wonderful time for any fungus. And sure. uh, so I'm starting to see some anthracnose in, in sycamores, uh, even, and there's some funguses hitting uh, birches too. I'm um, seeing some early leaf drop on that. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> I think one of the most common calls I've had from uh, customers have been about uh, fungal issues. Um, as you said, John, it's this is the year for fungal issues. Mm -hmm. um, lawn fungus, the rust in lawns, mm -hmm. which is is all of these things are controllable sure. to some degree. But as you mentioned, cleanup is just essential. Um, Absolutely, it, it's it's a good idea if you are okay with using chemicals, there are certainly fungicides to apply, even to your vegetables. Just read the labels. It's mm -hmm. so important to read the labels. But cleanup of your garden uh, debris, things that fall off, the leaves that you pull off, need to be taken out of the garden. That's just essential in, in, in keeping the health of your garden. So. Thanks, Marianne. That is so essential. Yeah, I guess really we can is. call 2015 the year of the fungus. <laughs> yeah, you probably <laughs> could. It's just been that year. <laughs> On a good note, I we've had some of the nicest caladiums in our garden that we've ever mm -hmm. had. Just yeah. all the rain and the nice cool weather, they're just gorgeous. Well, it certainly promoted a lot of flowering, um, and extended flowering, because we, we had kind of a cool season also, as, as mm -hmm. well as moist. And trees and shrubs and tree peonies and hydrangeas, almost everything everywhere has just bloomed. Fabulous. Yeah, they didn't get fried like yes. like other previous <laughs> years. Exactly. Oh, we've got some calls. Uh, line two, Mike has a pepper comment. Hello. Hi, Mike. Well, uh, last or a couple weeks ago, I heard some of your comments. All my pepper plants have been in big containers out on a concrete drive driveway facing a south, uh, face uh, uh, backed up by a brick wall, so mm -hmm. about as hot as you can get Ooh. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, great. Yeah, the, with all the rain we've had, there's been, especially if it's in <laughs> containers, the, the nitrogen and all the other, the phosphorus and, mm -hmm. and potash have all been leached out. Right. So normally we do it ourselves by watering and watering and watering, but this year it's just been Mother Nature. Sure. And so even the lawns and some of the garden areas are, are totally leached out. But I think that the, the, the location and that the, the caller is mentioning that it's in the south face, it's got the the uh, hardscape, it's got the, the wall, it's got the concrete where the heat is radiating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yes. we have a, uh, my grandmother's house, she has a, a south facing wall and we have some tomatoes there that have done exceptionally yeah. well compared mm -hmm. to other sure. tomatoes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. being in, in the spring, it was cool, so right. the, the, for the peppers and tomatoes, it's the more. ideal location. Yeah. Well, I happen to grow mine just like uh, our collar in, in pots on a hot driveway. Mm -hmm. I have a garage behind it, not a wall, but mm -hmm very warm situation mm -hmm. and the only thing bothering them is squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> well. There's always of something. <laughs> okay, line three. Linda has a question on dogwood pruning. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. Good evening. I um, have a dogwood tree that is planted close to a deck and it's sort of taller than the house now and I need to uh, really cut that back and I wondered, can I do that this time of the year? I don't think you can hurt a dogwood. No. Uh, if it, if, is it a red twig dogwood or yellow twig dogwood? Or uh, I'm not sure. I have quite a few dogwoods and red red buds around in the if backyard. It's, it sounds like flowering uh, dogwood. Yeah. yeah, if it's a flowering, then I would I would be you might cautious. Lose some you might lose some flowers, yeah. but you won't hurt the plant. Yeah, but uh, you have to be kind of careful. A little bit more careful on the flowering dogwoods rather than the red twig or the yellow twig. The yellow twig, you can take, the, I took mine all the way to the ground and they're back up to almost where they were. But the flowering dogwoods, uh, you have to be a little bit more selective. 
But even the trees, I think, are tough enough that they could tolerate. They, yeah, they can do. Getting a little bit, not not a major pruning, not not mm. big limbs, but you could do um, maybe a twenty or twenty five percent reduction mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. be pretty safe. Great. Yeah. Well, great questions tonight and great show. Lots of uh, good tips and hopefully the weather will cooperate for the rest of the season. And thanks for tuning in.